sent me to college because in order to be an officer in the in the Navy, you have to go to college. And I hadn't been to college. Where did so you go? I went to the University of San Diego. You went to the University of San Diego. What did you take there? I I was an English major. All right. So you finished college and then what happened? You're not going to ask me why I was an English major? Why were you an English major? I thought when he hears English major, he's going to say, wait a second, here you are, this guy talking about machine guns and blowing things up. What in God's name are you going to go study English for? I have to say that that thought did pass through my mind. Okay. Uh, Why was I an English major? I was an English major because, believe it or not, when you're in the SEAL teams, and especially when you're in, in the officer position, you have to write and read all the time. So when one of your troops does something and they deserve some kind of recognition for that, you have to write them an award. And if the award is written well, there's a much better chance that it'll actually be given to the person that you're writing it for. You have to write evaluations for your troops. And the evaluations that you write is how your troops are judged so that they can be promoted. On top of that, if you want to go do a mission, you have to write a concept of operations, which is a document, which is five, six, seven, eight pages long that you send up the chain of command that then they scour through and see if they're going to approve your mission or not. You know, that's so insanely important. You know, I mean, one of the things <laughs> I did a talk at Harvard four years ago and I pointed out two things to the students in the audience. One was that a tremendous amount of civilization and effort had gone into producing the institution that they were now part of, and that everyone who was part of that institution was hoping that they would come there and learn everything they possibly could that was relevant and important, and that they would be the best possible people they could be, and they would go out in the world and do as much good as they possibly could. That was the essential mission of the enterprise. And that was really the case. And also that learning to write in particular was going to make them more powerful than they could imagine. And a number of students came up to me afterwards and said, I really wish someone would have said that to us when we first came here. And it's the writing part of that. I, I kind of got obsessed with that when I was working as a professor and I'm working on a piece of software right now to help, which will launch soon um, to help people write. Because what I observed in my own career, and, and it's so interest, the parallelism is so interesting, but not surprising is that nothing can stop you if you can write. And it's for the reasons you just laid out. It's like when you write, you make a case for something, whatever it happens to be. And if you make the best case, well, then you win and you get whatever it is that you're aiming at. And so, you know, you said, maybe that's why I didn't ask you why you went into English. I I guess that might have been the reason is that the utility of learning to write is so self-evident to me that it, it could pass by without question. But it's also interesting to think about how it fits into this this broader well, let's say at least partially military slash strategic way of looking at things. You know, you, you, you describe the intense relationship between marshalling your arguments properly, getting everything in order on the page and making strategic progress truly in the military sense that those things are tied together very, very precisely. And it's obviously your ability to communicate as well. That's, that's, Well, look what it's done. You have your podcast, you have your YouTube channel, you have your books, which many of which you self-published. So that ability to communicate is, it's, I just can't understand why it's not presented, especially, not entirely, but especially to adventurous, well, let's say young men. We could say young people. You're adventurous. You want to make a mark? Is you bloody well better learn how to write. Because if you learn how to write, well, then you can think and you can communicate your thoughts. So not only are you deadly strategically, you become extremely convincing. And then you can go and do anything you want, and no one will stop you. And that's never told to people. And I, 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 I don't really understand why. You know, you hear the pen is mightier than the sword, which is just a cliche unless it's fleshed out. But the reason, you laid out the reasons perfectly. Yeah. You, and then, you have to communicate what happened as well as having it had had it happen. Right. So 
you, you, you already connected the dots, but obviously not only am I having to write and present my argument, I'm also having orders being issued to me, which are written. You, I'm sure you've heard the term rules of engagement. Well, rules of engagement is a 12 page document that is in a bunch of legalese. And I've got to translate that document to my troops, some of whom, you know, barely graduated high school. And so I've got to be able to do that. So I've got to be able to read and then write and be able to then communicate and, and, and talk to the team and brief them in a manner that they can actually understand what it is I'm talking about and what it is our mission is and why we're doing this mission. So that was why I decided to study English when I, when I went to college and believe. So that was a conscious decision. Absolutely. And and with that end in mind that it was, so tell, tell me exactly what the decision was with regards to studying English. What did you know that, because it's not, as you pointed out, it's not self-evidently the most practical of pursuits and not necessarily what you'd expect someone with a military orientation to pursue. Right. Here's the, here's the thought process. I want to be a good seal. The good seals that I see can communicate, they can write, and they can read. That's what I need to learn how to do. I need to learn how to do that better so that I can persuade my chain of command that we need to do this mission or we need this piece of gear or this guy over here needs to get an award or he needs to get promoted. All those things are done by being able to write and communicate properly. And okay, so, so let's say you take the example of a seal who's got it all. But this literacy, okay, so what what happens to him compared to someone who has all those skills? Well, if he can't if he can't write well and he's in charge of six guys and one of those guys works hard or does something that deserves to be recognized, this is the responsibility of that leader to write that person an award. Okay, so he can't reward his he can't reward his his good workers, his good soldiers. He can give him a pat on the back, but a yeah. pat on the back isn't going to get him promoted. An award is actually worth some points towards your promotion. And the people that are on that board that are giving that reward, they're never going to meet that leader and they're definitely not going to meet that guy. There's no there's no bias. It's based on this piece of paper that you hand in. You hand in this piece of paper, they read the piece of paper and they say award approved or award not approved. Mm-hmm. Or You want to do a mission and you send that up the chain of command and it's the same thing. It gets to a certain point where they're just looking at it and reading and trying to decipher this pile of junk that you put together. And by the way, if I'm in charge and Jordan sends me a concept of operations that doesn't make any sense, why would I possibly let you go out and execute an operation that I can't even understand what it is you're trying to do? So it has a huge impact. It has a huge impact. Okay, well, I'm dwelling on this because it's it's upsetting to me, I would say, that young people in particular aren't stringently instructed that the ability to, that literacy makes them powerful in every way they can possibly imagine, except the absolutely immediate. And well, so it's just hmm. sad to me that it's not sold in that manner. You want to be weak? Stay illiterate. You want to be strong? It's like put yourself together physically. Fair enough, man. Get brave and street smart. But then you could add some literacy to that and you're an unstoppable machine. So I concur 100%. And, you know, you said being literate makes you powerful. And throughout recent history, if we're trying to oppress someone, what we don't want them to be able to do is read or write. Or, or articulate themselves. Right. Well, we haven't even talked about reading. You know, we just talked about writing and, and fair enough. So, but obviously you studied English, so you also read. And so what's the advantage to that as far as you're concerned, practically speaking? Well, um, obviously there are so many lessons that you can pull out of books. And you you can get to a point where nothing really surprises you because you've at least seen some indication of what can unfold through reading. So uh, again, for me, it's very much focused on combat and war, 
but there's there's lessons that you learn and you say, oh, I, I, I've seen that before. There, there's a book. It's it is a book called About Face, which I think the, the last time you and I talked, you were, I think you were writing the foreword for for the Gulag, and I was about to write the foreword to. I don't know if that's your favorite book, but. I, I was lucky enough to be able to write the forward for my favorite book, which was re-released because I was talking about it all the time. And the book Great. is called about the book is called About Face. And it's it's about a guy that was in the Korean War and then he was in the Vietnam War. And his name is Colonel David Hackworth. But I would read that book. It, when I was on deployment, I would read, open up that book anywhere and I would read two pages or three pages before I'd go to bed if I was in my bed that night. And and there were so many lessons that correlated to what I was actually going through. And a, a real obvious example was when he was in Vietnam, he's working with the South Vietnamese soldiers and therefore by proxy, the South Vietnamese government. And guess what? They're all corrupt and they're not motivated and they don't have the right gear. And here we are in Iraq and we're working with Iraqi soldiers and therefore by proxy, we're working with the Iraqi government. And guess what? They're all corrupt and they're, they're, they're not well equipped. And how do you, how did he deal with it? How do we deal with it? So there's an example of when you read, you can learn and you don't have to you don't have to go through the school of hard knocks. You don't have to get punched in the face repeatedly with things that turn out to be situations that other people have absolutely gone through. And the amount of the amount of the 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 the, the level of capability increases so much by seeing something one single time. Well, if I see something one time, I, I'm I'm infinitely better than if I'd never seen it before. So if if it's like those you know those little puzzles, they give you a little puzzle, some kind of a mind bender, right? The mind benders only work on you one time. The riddle only works on you one time. Then you go, I I know the answer to that. That's the answer. You know, you never get fooled by that again. So just knowing, just seeing it one time, you're infinitely better. So when you read enough. You're capturing all these lessons. And, and you know what? It's, I got to say this. It's not just reading. It's not just reading. And, and I learned this because as I started doing my podcast, and m- many of my podcasts are just me reading books, I, I realized how to read more intently, even more intently than I did when I was going to college and I was going to be you know, writing a paper about a book. And so I'd read it in a certain way, but you, even that reading was a little bit detached, a little bit detached because you're looking for a theme or you're looking for character development or, or what have you. But when you read to learn about human nature and life, you, you, you detach less and you kind of put yourself in there and you experience it a little bit closer and then when you take a step back, you go, oh, yeah, I, I know what he was thinking right there because I was right there with him. And so there's a certain attitude. You kind of have to put yourself into the work and and really read it with that kind of uh, intensity, if for lack of a better word. Is it is it possible well, for a human being to read intensely? Absolutely. I just don't. Because Absolutely. that's what I try and do. I get well. There. That's no different than 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 acting intensely or playing intensely. Of course, you want to put the book on. You want to become that person. And that can rattle you up, man. Especially if the person is thinking all sorts of things that you've never thought. I mean, I love reading for that reason. I could pick my peers too, which I really loved. It's like, well, you know, I have these people around me, but then there's these people who who've lived before me and in different places and I can set them up on my shelf. I can enter into their world and I can benefit from everything they've thought and saturate myself with that person. It's, and it's very disruptive, especially if the person that you're reading has a mind that's more powerful and more well-developed than your own. I mean, Friedrich Nietzsche spun me around for about three years and I was reading Jung at the same time intensely and the same thing, you know, it, it was very, disruptive, but unbelievably useful, unbelievably useful to try on other people like that. And you get the benefit of their entire life distilled into their, into their book. You know, it, it, it's 30 years of work. I, I read this one book called The Neuropsychology of Anxiety, which is a, it's a great scientific work. I think it's the greatest neuropsychological work of the last 50 years. It's a very hard book. 
I think it has 1800 references, something like that. And this guy, Jeffrey Gray, he actually read all those references and he understood them. And so it took me six months to read the book, but I got an entire education out of it. I got to experience in six months what it took him 30 years to learn. Like what a gift that is. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. I was, I was listening to an interview with uh, Gary Kasparov, I think you said, Russian. He was a chess world champion for 20 years, something like this. And he, they asked him, and it, they, the, the interviewer didn't ask him directly if he could beat this young, young guy named Magnus Carlsen, who's the current kind of prodigy of chess. He's just phenomenal and the highest chess rating ever, et cetera, et cetera. And he didn't get asked directly if he could beat him, but it was definitely implied, if I remember the interview correctly. And and it was very interesting to me. Gary Kasparov, there was two things that I found interesting. Number one was he said, I, he's younger than me. And he didn't mean that in, like that was an advantage for, for Gary. He meant it, he's younger than me. So he has an advantage. Magnus yeah. has an advantage because he's younger. And I kind of thought to myself, well, that's kind of weird because – this isn't a physical, this isn't a wrestling match. This isn't a jujitsu match. Why would that help? And then sure enough, you learn a little bit about cognitive decline. And Gary Kasparov is 57 years old when he did this interview. And, and guess what? You start, well, depending on who you are, but you start to see cognitive, cognitive decline around that time. And I'm Hell, sure it kicks in at 25. Well, You're, there so you go. There's, you can IQ is pretty unitary, but you can fracture it into crystallized and and fluid and fluid IQ is what enables you to learn. Mm -hmm. And it declines from 25 onward. Crystallized intelligence continues to grow, roughly speaking, because it's partly dependent on such things as vocabulary, which you can learn and which accumulate. But interestingly enough, you know, you were talking about physically the best way to stave off cognitive decline is not cognitive activity. It's exercise. Weightlifting and cardiovascular exercise can will, is the it's by far the most potent means of staving off cognitive decline. Yeah. So Kasparov would have the advantage in terms of experience, but the younger guy would have the edge on on sheer raw brain power. That's what I thought too. That's what I thought too. But guess what? It's wrong, and it's wrong for the exact reason that you just said. So. Magnus Carlsen, when he's 11 years old, he gets to open up a book and see every single match and move that Gary Kasparov ever right. made. Oh, because yes. that's what they do. They document that stuff. Of and they course. Do it. And so what he got to do was what you got to do. You got to learn a person's 30 years experience in six months. Well, this young kid, Matt, so, so this, where it might have taken Gary Kasparov, you know, eight years or four years to figure out how to get out of some particular quandary on the chessboard. Well, Magnus just opened to a page in a book and said, Oh, that if I ever get in that quandary, I'm there. And so what Magnus got to do is he got to start from here. Right. And build. And so I make this point from a leadership perspective. Yeah. We can do the same things as, as leaders. We don't have to figure all this stuff out. We can jump up to Gary Kasparov's level or at least get a baseline of what he knew and, and win because we learned. It's very interesting to me. Well, you think, and again, with regards to selling this sort of thing, um, you know, I'm stunned that it's possible to make history boring, for example. People should be so enthralled with history that they can't get enough of it. But with reading, you imagine... You have this opportunity to learn whatever you want from the greatest people who ever lived along that dimension. And, and well, it's stunning to me that that is a hard sell. Mm. It, it's mysterious that, that it's, that, that it isn't something that everyone is just clamoring for. I mean, that to me, that points to a devastating failure, inadequacy of the education system, mm -hmm. a, a mysterious inadequacy. Yeah, there's a, I think maybe the transaction isn't always clear for people. I, I always talk about, well, if you're going to sell somebody, if you're going to sell somebody a book, you know, if I'm going to sell you a book, Jordan, you've got to give me $20 and eight hours of your time. 
right? That, that's what you know you're going to give me. You're going to give me $20 and you're going to give me eight hours of time, which you would probably, you know, have other things that you might need to do. And the transaction is not always clear of what you're going to get out of that, especially when, look, you can spend a lot of time reading books and not get as much as you might want. You might not get your $20 worth out of a book. So you have to be somewhat selective. Now, luckily, it's not even that hard to figure out which books to read because there's so many reviews and 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 history about where these books came from and the and the productivity that they resulted in. So, but I think it's hard sometimes for. Look, I can I can only speak for myself. When I was younger, it was really hard for me to figure out that transaction. Yeah, you know, wait, fair I'm enough. Like I had a librarian um, when I was 13 um, who told me what to read which is what a teacher should do, right? There's nothing a teacher can do for you that's better than say, well, here's 10 books that will change you completely and who actually knows that to be the case. And one of the things I'd really like to do, I, I, I've toyed with, um, well, with the whole concept of online education, one thing I'd really like to do is to divide up the variety of, of domains of learning and identify the top 10 books in each domain. So to ask an expert, it's like, well, you're a historian, you're a great historian. What 10 books are crucial? And I have a list on my website, a list of recommended books. There's about 100 of them that have been instrumental for me. And lots of people have used that list to purchase books. So that's been really good. But I'd really like to extend, extend and expand it. Yeah, so I, I have the same thing on my website the books from the podcast and same thing, we, all kinds of those books get sold. And it's it's beautiful to see, but the people that are checking the website or listening to the podcast, they know that, that those books have been through a filter. They're there for a reason. They're yeah. there because they're going to be worth that transaction. And I think that's a, a tough sell for for a lot of people. They can't figure out, maybe they've invested in books before and they didn't quite get the return on investment that they wanted and buy two or three books and 50 or $60 and 20 or 30 hours. Yeah, they that's, that's a great observation, I think, because one of the advantages to coming from a literate background is that you do, in fact, reduce the transaction costs because there's an infinite number of books. I mean, well, no, there isn't. But <laughs> as far as we're concerned, there might as well be. And so the question of what to read really is daunting if you don't know anyone who reads. Like, where do I start? And, and, and how can I not be a fool in doing this? So, well, okay, back to English. So what, what were you reading when you were in university? Was it, was it fiction, novels? Was it nonfiction? What, what, were, you, what were you focusing on? Uh it was like your basic English literature. That's what I studied. And so I read everything. I read everything, you know, from each one of the little periods and I took the various classes and, and really uh, as trite as this may sound, it was actually the, the most impact was from Shakespeare. It was the most impact on, on multiple levels. And I'll tell you the primary level. And when I've covered Shakespeare on my podcast, I explain this to people People think, well, you know, I didn't really understand. I, I read it and understand it. And, I, I, and so I start off when I talk about Shakespeare on my podcast, I start off by saying, listen, if you think you're going to just pick up Shakespeare, open it up and read it and understand it, you're not going to because it's barely written in English. It's barely written in English. It's almost another language. And so you're not going to be able to just pick it up and read through it. It's, it's, it's written in, in almost other language. So what you have to do is you have to start to interpret it. And so what I realized with, with Shakespeare is, number one, the weight of the words, that these words were so pregnant with meaning that you had to pull those words and parse those words and pull those words apart to see all the depth that each individual word had and then the way that they're put together. And what was great about this was by the time I was back, because then I went right back into the SEAL teams and somebody would hand me a rules of engagement document and that was written by some lawyer in Washington, D.C. And I'd pull it out and say, wait a second, this word, I don't know what this word means. So let's pull this word out. Let's see what this, let's see what this actual definition of this particular word is and how that changes my viewpoint of these rules of engagement. And how can I translate that for my troops so that they actually know what to do? So that part uh, for me, was from a reading perspective, starting to read Shakespeare and and saying, oh, okay, you're not going to understand this. And if you don't understand something, that's okay. You pull out 
the Oxford English Dictionary, and you look it up. And then you not just find out what the meaning of the word is, but what's the root word and where does it come from and what kind of depth and what kind yeah, of... Yeah, and that's really, the, that's, that's unbelievably useful to, to discover the connotation of words. And the Oxford English Dictionary is particularly good for that because you, you discover things that you'd never guess by looking at how the word developed. I, I mentioned the word hamartia, like the fact that the word for sin was derived from an archery concept was revelatory to me. It's like, that's so cool. It ties this moral concept, abstract philosophy back down to something as, as primordial as weaponry and hunting. And just the fact that that's the metaphor is absolutely fascinating. And, and then there's the overlap in meaning that I already referred to. And virtually every word is like that because word is an ancient artifact it's like it's 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 like an it's like an animal in some sense it has an evolutionary history and it transforms across time and each word kind of it carries the echoes of its past with it too because each word um attracts other words in a particular unique way so it kind of lives in a word ecosystem as well and the ecosystem contain information about the history of that word and you think well why is that important it's like well hey guess what you think in words, you talk in words, you have all these archaic, uh, what are what, these archaic entities, these words, these living entities that you use. It's like the more you know about them, the more you know about you, the more you know about other people, and the better you are at formulating and communicating your ideas. There's nothing, there's nothing lost in that kind of investigation. Nothing, there's nothing but gain there. So, yeah, and that's that was so that was the uh, that was the English road for me and and it was good thing i asked you that question eh yeah that was really <laughs> really insightful for you to come up with that thank you thank you <laughs> selling or providing an online service can be a hassle if you think about it in terms of physically moving and setting up shop but extremely enticing if you do it with shopify it can be a bit nerve-wracking but that's part of the excitement shopify looks great and makes it easy their 24 7 support team doesn't hurt with the ease Every 28 seconds, someone makes their first sale on Shopify. That could be you, or it could be your evil neighbor. Shopify accepts all major payment methods, and their tools make it super simple to land new customers. Don't let your evil neighbor get there first. Join millions of entrepreneurs and go from first sale to full scale with Shopify. I'm going to be using it for my electrolytes. Go to shopify.com slash jbp, all lowercase, and get a free 14-day trial. Don't miss out on extra income. Start selling today at shopify.com slash jbp, all lowercase, and get a free 14-day trial. Some of us, maybe even many of us, have decided 2022 is the year we finally learn a new language. It should be engaging and fun, but more often than not, it's more like pushing the proverbial boulder up the hill. People underestimate how helpful multiple languages are. Babbel makes the language learning process fun. Other apps have lesson plans made by AI, but that's not the case with Babbel, whose plans were created by over 100 language experts with scientifically proven methods. They also offer 14 languages, a 20-day money-back guarantee, and a seriously interesting interface. Start your journey today with the app with over 10 million subscriptions. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to babbel.com and use promo code Peterson. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com code Peterson. Babbel, language for life. Let's talk about CFOs, chief financial officers. Today's CFO is critical to the strategy and success of the business. And in growing companies, there are two kinds of CFOs. One who's struggling to keep up, spreadsheets everywhere, manual processes, errors, and lack of visibility in the numbers, takes weeks to close the books. The others on top of their game, automated reports, inventory, e-commerce, and HR all flow into the financial model seamlessly, insights coming with the click of a button. The CFOs that get it, get it. The CFOs that don't, don't. NetSuite has everything you need in one place increased control and visibility, automate tasks, and close books fast. There's a reason it's the number one cloud financial system for growth. Like I said, some get it and some don't, but 93% of businesses report higher visibility after the upgrade. Join over 28,000 of them that 
are already using NetSuite. Head over to netsuite.com slash Jordan for a special one-of-a-kind financing offer. That's netsuite.com slash Jordan. netsuite.com slash Jordan. The question of what constitutes an acceptable value structure is an incredibly deep question. And maybe part of the reason that your books have been successful is because so many people are asking that question now. What? what? I think so. Uh, sorry. I, um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, anticipating your question, uh, which I assume is, is why, why, why is that? <laughs> well, and what's it done or, for sorry. you? This investigation. Um, well, it, it's that that's, that's an interesting question because it's, I've always seen my work, you know, and my, my background is just, is blogging. Um, I'm not, I don't have an academic background in this stuff like you do. Um, but I started blogging in 2008 and it initially, I kind of used it as my own vehicle for personal development. Um, growth, developing emotional intelligence, managing relationships, all these things. And so kind of the way my career career has unspooled uh, is whatever issue I'm kind of struggling with at that period of my life, um, I investigate it and then I write about it as, and the writing is kind of my own personal form of digestion, I suppose. And there's, I, I just kind of have this faith that if I'm going through it, then there must be a lot of other people going through it as well. I actually and think that's I, the answer to why your book was so successful, is that it is the case that there's a large population of people who are, who have the same questions that you do, and yeah. and are stumped in the same way that you are or were, and that you're leading them through a process of investigation and thought at exactly the level that's. Um, there's this idea from developmental psychology that a man named Vygotsky originated called the zone of proximal development. And adults speak to infants and toddlers with implicit knowledge of the zone of proximal development. And what they do is speak at a level that's slightly more advanced than the infant or toddler can understand. And that leads yeah. them so they, they can mostly understand the adult speech, but not quite. And that leads them further, right? They can understand, but they're also forced to develop further understanding. And I've noticed when I was teaching that it was often the case that when I was trying to figure out something out, that was the best time to teach it rather than after I had figured it out. Because then I would have forgot what the problem was and also what I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I, I think part of it is, this is kind of the hypothesis I lay out in the book, and it, it's something I still believe, but I think when you when you live in a society where information is no longer scarce where there's essentially more stuff for you to consume and understand and learn about than is humanly possible um the most obvious question becomes what is worth pursuing what is worth learning about what is worth trusting and believing in i think if you look at previous generations um you know information was scarce opportunities were more scarce and so people had kind of from an early point in their life, a, a more clear path of what they should be following um, and, and what they should be learning about. And I think today, starting with millennials and even more so with Gen Z, it's, you know, we've grown up with this overabundance of information and, and, and opportunity of, of paths, life paths to choose for ourselves. And so it, it kind of, on paper, that sounds like a great thing. And it is a great thing in a lot of ways, but it also kind of invites these existential questions of what is worth pursuing. And, um, I just found that, you know, myself and a lot of my peers and, and, and friends kind of went into what most people would call midlife crisis in our twenties. And, um, and, and for me, writing subtle art was kind of writing my way out of that. It was, as you said, investigating these value structures, you know, going back to the philosophers and trying to understand, you know, wh what their ideas around these things were. And, um, and it's for me, it kind of, you asked me, you know, your original question was, what did it do for me? For me, it, it gave me a sense of, um, sense that I understood um, 
where I was, I guess, uh, I, I guess it helped me create like a map, um, uh, of how to navigate my life. And, um, and so it was, with subtle art, it was kind of, I wanted to provide the right questions for a lay person, you know, somebody who's not going to go read Nietzsche or somebody who's not going to study existentialism to ask the right questions that will kind of help them do the same thing, um, in a more basic way. If you're trying to exist creatively, not only is it a very high risk proposition financially, yeah. but you lack that psychological uh, comfort that comes from routine, which, you know, people, artistic people often are hy hypercritical it's, of routine, but God alive, man, routine oh, keeps you sane and trying to invent you. yourself every day. That's that's not for the faint hearted. I've seen very few people manage that successfully across decades. No, absolutely. And I, I think particular, you know, particularly in comedy, you know, you, because you have to work for about three or four years on the circuit without getting paid anything. In fact, you're losing money because you're paying for your travel expenses and then you get somewhere and you don't get, you don't get paid for it. And, and it's, this is why a lot, you'll find a lot of comedians, particularly in the UK are from, are from quite wealthy backgrounds or privately educated because they, you know, they have rich parents who can help them out, put them up in a flat and they don't have to work during the day and, and they escalate much quicker through the ranks but uh, it, but if you come from my sort of background you can't do that you have to have the job and then and and you have to it's like having two jobs uh and so you have to really care about it i mean my my advice is always that i do believe although it comes with that insecurity if it is a vocation for you you have to do i mean for me i couldn't have done anything it's it is a genuine vocation for me even if i were making no money whatsoever out of comedy or writing all the rest, I would still be doing it because I would feel unfulfilled if I were not doing it. I think there's something also quite, I mean, I take your point about the practicalities of living and the business of living, but my God, I think uh, depriving yourself of your vocation can be so soul destroying. I think. No, it is. Well, for, for I've, I've spent a lot of time studying creativity scientifically. And mm. um, the first thing that's useful to note is that creativity is not common. I mean, mm. everyone isn't creative. That's wrong. Yeah. Some people are very creative. A minority of people are very creative. And I mean, it's it's a continuum, but you don't get, you know, you don't get creativity till you get out to the point where what you're doing is original. And that's very yeah. difficult. So it's a minority proposition. And then of those original people, there's only a tiny fraction that can make a successful financial go of it because it's just you have to be creative, plus you have to have some sense for marketing and sales and business, and you have to be reasonably emotionally stable and et cetera, et cetera. It's very, very difficult. But if you are creative by temperament, well, that's you. That's and it. to not do that is to not be you. It's like ha asking an extroverted pe person not to be around people or an agreeable person not to engage in intimate relationships or a conscientious person not to be driven by duty. It's like, that's what you're like. And so, yeah, yeah you're stuck with it. It's a double-edged sword creativity. It's vital. It's yeah. entrancing. It's necessary. Um, it's transformative. It's disruptive. But it's a high-risk, high-risk, high high-return game. And the probability of failure is overwhelmingly high. Even if you're an entrepreneur and, and, you know, more practically oriented in your creativity, the probability that you'll make money from your innovation or your invention rather than other people is very, very low. But, but you need to find a way. I mean, it's, it's also very difficult if you're a creative person to, to a lot of creative people don't think in practical terms. They don't think in terms of uh, m money, actually. They're hopeless. A lot of them I, I know are hopeless in this. No, stuff, they also tend to be casually contemptuous of that and to regard it right. as practical concerns as selling out. It's like you should be bloody happy if you have the opportunity well, to sell out. So I think that the, the, the ideal is to find a way to pursue your vocation, but have one eye on the reality that, you know, you will have to earn money somewhere or another. Yes, I mean, yes, that, I and I think it, it, it's, it's, that's why I think I'm lucky insofar as with Titania, I hit on something that had commercial viability, but it was very true to what I desperately wanted to do. And I think that's so rare. I think uh, uh, some of the stuff I've written, some of the plays I've written, for instance, I don't think would have any commercial success whatsoever, but I wrote them because I needed to write them. And, and, and some of them didn't even get on and maybe one day they will, and that would be great. But what right, if you well, just think of, what you have to accomplish though, right? You have to have, right your creative endeavor aligned with market demand at exactly that time. Right. 
It's impossible. It, yes, yeah, so it's and very, very unlikely. Actually, that's why I always say don't attempt to to uh, anticipate the zeitgeist because you won't. You, like the best thing an artist can do is do what they believe and hope because a lot of it is luck. You yes, know I mean? well, and if I mean, there's actually, there's a technical literature on that too. I mean, what essentially what you do is continue to produce ideas. And right. it's a Darwinian competition, essentially. They're like life forms, these ideas. And now and then one will find a niche that it can thrive in. But but the best way to uh, maximize your chances that that niche will manifest itself is to be, um, is to overproduce. Because I right. uh, look, yeah, for, right. I'll give you an example. I answered a bunch of questions on Quora. So that's a website where anybody can ask any questions and anybody can answer. I answered about 50 when I was playing with Quora. And mm -hmm. one of them was a list of everything people should know, of things people should know in their life. And I derived my books out of that list. Yes. Um, it was disproportionately successful. Most of the answers I generated got virtually no views, but it got, it must be hundreds of thousands now. But even before I wrote the books, it was tens of thousands. But yeah. had I not written 50, I wouldn't have got that one. The other right. 49 failures, so to speak, were... The, the, the answers weren't necessarily worse. They just didn't hit the zeitgeist like that, that answer did. And, and I think that's a great piece of advice. Over, overproduction, because it's the same with the Beatles. They, 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 they look like an overnight success. It's because they've been playing endlessly in those dingy clubs in, in Europe, you know, b before, before it happened. It's, it, you, you, you produce yeah, they as say much it as takes you can. 10 years to become an overnight success. That's, that's it. So it, you know, of, of most of the things I've written have done nothing and gone nowhere and had no success whatsoever. It's just, but, but the one thing occasionally when it hits, that's, that's what sustains all the rest of it. And it's, it's also it's, why creativity it's, is, is continues to be selected. Let's say from a biological yeah. perspective, it's like, that's why I said it was a high risk, high return game. Almost everything you do creatively will fail, but yes. now and then you're disproportionately successful. And so that keeps well, the whole game going. You didn't have any sense, did you, that when you put the lectures on YouTube that it would explode in this way? Did it, I mean, that was Not wasn't... in this way. This was completely... I still... I, I'm still shocked constantly so by my well, life. The... I'm shocked <laughs> out, of, out of sanity by my life. I just can't... This is why I asked you about Titania. You know, you, you get at the center of a whirlwind like that, and there's something very surreal about it. And I mean, yeah. I, I keep getting hit by surreal things and it's very hard to wrap my head around it. Like this Red Skull episode was just <laughs> one of many equally surreal occurrences. But yes, but, no, I had no, I had no idea. I knew and, I was working on something important back when I was in my 20s, when I wrote my first book. And it yeah. was out of that that all my lectures came. And I spent 15 years working on that book and I worked on it about three hours a day. And so yeah. I, re I, and I thought about it all the time. And so I knew there was something to it, not necessarily because they were my ideas, but because of the people who I had read and, and delved into while I was writing the book, I knew the ideas were significant. Uh, and, and I could see the effect of the ideas when I was lecturing on my students. So I had some sense that there was something vital that I was involved in something vital, but Sure. But, but had you uploaded those videos uh, a couple of years before or a couple of years later, you probably would have missed the zeitgeist and nothing would have happened. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter. I, I always think with any kind of creative endeavor or, in, or intellectual endeavor, it doesn't matter how good you are in a sense. It has to be good and the timing has to be right. And and like you say, if you just keep, I think persistence is it. If you just keep doing it, not only does your craft get better and, and you, you are, when if it does hit, you're in a position to There's be able no to doubt. It. Look, if you if you okay, so in in scientific literature, the hallmark of impact is citations. And so mm -hmm. if your work is cited, it means that someone who's written another scientific article makes reference to something you wrote. And yes. that's all tracked and it's used for promotions and it's used to judge scientific merit. It's 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 its, its own science, uh, citation tracking. Um a very small number of your published papers accrue most of the citations. So that's the first mm -hmm. thing. So what that means is the more papers you publish, the more likely it is that one of them will become highly cited. And my highly cited papers aren't necessarily the ones that I thought would be most impactful. So yeah, um, you. but the other uh, piece of information from 
literature on creativity is that the best predictor of quality, and so you could index quality by impact, let's say, or by citations, is quantity. Yeah, It's not a great predictor, but it's the best one. And so and this is good advice for everyone out there who's a musician or an artist. It's like, produce, 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 produce as much as you can, because you do get better at it, right? You absolutely do. And, and so there's that, but there's also, I think the other important thing is to to actually be true to yourself in, in your artistic endeavors insofar as don't be trying to anticipate the design guys. Don't be trying to anticipate what other people are doing. I, I, my, my big concern in the current climate that we live in is that a lot of artists are choosing to self censor because the penalty for risk taking has got too high. Uh, you know, you can be completely, uh, I mean, if I think of well, an that's example, a good, like, think about what kind of catastrophe that is because we've already discussed the fact that the impediments to creativity are almost insurmountable. And so right. then you add an additional one, which is self-censorship because of social pressure. It's like you just decimate the creative enterprise by doing that. We wouldn't have anything. We, 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 the Western canon would be decimated. It's ridiculous. I mean, a, an example I often think of is, is one of my favorite playwrights is Edward Albee. And when he came to write his play, The Goat, which was a very controversial play because it was about a man having an affair, a sexual affair with a goat behind his wife's back. And obviously that doesn't sound palatable. Well, at least um, he went beside, behind his wife's back. Exactly. At least it wasn't sort of an open sort of paganistic thing. Absolutely. But um, he, I mean, it's it's a shocking play and it's meant to be. It's about uh, where our lines of tolerance are, where they lie and why. Um, and all of his friends told him, don't do this. You've got a, a valuable career, an incredible reputation. You're turning 80. You're 80. He was roughly 80 years old when this play came out. And they said, you're just going to scupper everything. And he said that one, when that he got that response, that's the reason he did it. He went out there and he, he put the play on and it turned out to be a huge success. It won, I think, the Tony Award for Best Play. It was critically and commercially successful. It was absolutely massive. So um, it just goes to show, I think, uh, to an extent, I mean, I'm not saying disregard uh, feedback from other creative people or people who, who, who have suggestions. But what I am saying is if you're true to your muse, whatever that that is, uh, the rewards will come, actually, or, or they are more likely to okay, come. Okay, so that brings us back to free speech, too, because, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> the problem with laws that abridge free speech is they abridge creative endeavor. And that's a terrible thing because it's the source of endless renewal. And it it's the thing that does. fixes corrupt structures. And so to to take aim at that is to take aim at the very process that would rescue you from the conundrum you 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 are pretending to be obsessed by. I wrote the screenplay for Love and Honor, and that got me into the office of a young woman named Rebecca Pollock, who's Sidney Pollock's daughter. Sidney Pollock directed Out of Africa, Jeremiah Johnson, um, Three Days of the Condor. And I told her the story of Braveheart in about 10 minutes. And she went, my God, go write that. And I said, do you want an outline or something? And she went, what, I'm going to tell you how to write act two? Go write that. And um, and that led me into... What do you think it was about you that, uh, that made doors open for you like that? It, it's quite a remarkable theme. I mean, these are all very difficult enterprises to gain a foothold in. And, and you tell stories over and over about people offering you the chance. Was that the salesman, the salesman skill that your father had? Do you think what, what was it? I, I, I have to guess Jordan, because the, to see ourselves as others see us yeah. is clearly the hard thing. But I do think, I do think I am, am um, incredibly blessed that I had this salesman father whose heart was as big as the ocean. And I had, this brilliant mother who was, who was absolute steel inside and, and tender. I mean, she was, she was an iron, iron hand and a velvet glove. And, um, well, it and makes sense because you think, well, you need the creativity and you've got that and you need the discipline to work and you've got that, but that's not enough. You have to be able to market. You have to be able to make contact with people. You have to be able to communicate with them about your material because otherwise you languish. But you Absolutely. had that too. Yes, but I, I think there's I think there's something and and look you know whenever anyone says, oh this was a, you know, thank goodness I have this gift of God is so self-aggrandizing like you're elevating your your gifts but but I think there was there is a 
a thing that I didn't create, but I have chosen to follow, which is there's something about being bold and being willing to take the punch, to, to be able to walk in. It's like when I decided I would write my screenplay first. I like, I like writing original screenplays without going to a company and saying, um, like it was an original screenplay, what we call a spec screenplay that got yep. me into Rebecca's office in the first place that got her to listen about Braveheart. And there's, there's an element of tremendous daring to say, I, I don't have to have your endorsement or your money to sit down and write this. And in fact, I like the equation of it to say, if I write this, and I've made this choice a dozen times in my career, if I write it and it doesn't sell, I will live with that. But I will have written what I believe. I will have written what I want. I will have written the movie I want to make. And if you say you don't want to buy it, the next guy might, and then you're going to look like an idiot. And that, that equation... That theme comes out quite strongly in Secretariat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Because she pursues that that investment in in her horse, in that famous remarkable horse. Yes, single mindedly, and yes. and and in a and and at high risk. Yes, and I I feel that um, there's something, and obviously we can be we can be uh, projecting this onto the horse. But the, the metaphor of the movie for me was, I, actually, I wrote, the, I wrote the song of the end credits um, called It's Who You Are. Um, it's not the prize. It's not the game. It's not the score. It's not the fame. When every road looks way too far, it's not what you have. It's who you are. And in that, you choose your race, and then you run. And, and I'll... I'll say that to myself over and over. I, I say it to myself daily. Is don't miss the chance to live this day. And when I, I'm divorced and it was the most wrenching, horrific thing of my life. And I would, I would get out of bed in the morning and drop straight down to my knees and pray for the strength to get through the day. And at the end of the day, when I would get down on my knees to say thanks, I would think, well, I did have faith today. I did get through the day and, and at least enough to get through the day. And, and if did it that catapult you into depression as well. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, it's, it sounds like it from what you're relating and, and, and that came through in your book too, that that, I mean, you don't t talk about it much, but when you touch on it, it's quite clear that that was, an experience that, you know, took this, the slats out from underneath you. Yes. And, and, and that, that, uh, and I don't, I don't talk about it too much because, you know, there are other people involved, but you know, it's my family and it was wrenching for all of us, but it, it may be the d depression also contributed. Yes. To, you know, the, the, it was it's, it's highly a, probable. A it's very difficult to cause. live with someone who has a pre predisposition to depression. Yeah, it's yeah. hard, and so, um, so yeah, it, it 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 certainly it certainly was the fight and f within me, and um, uh, but at the same time, there was there was something beautiful. I mean, there were many beautiful things that come out of such darkness. Um, one was um, I was putting up Christmas lights at the that the house I had moved to to try to rebuild my life and. And, and my sons, I would see my sons three days a week. And the, the, that was very strained. And, and, um, and I was trying to make my home look beautiful. And I was putting up Christmas lights and I was getting really depressed. And um, I was talking with my therapist, who's a brilliant guy. And, and I told him about that. And I said, you know, I can't really date anybody. And I, I you know, I'm not seeing my sons enough. And my neighbors don't celebrate Christmas and, and I'm, I'm putting up Christmas lights and I'm getting more depressed doing it. And he said, well, how about this? You don't put your Christmas lights up 
for your neighbors to see. You don't put them up for someone you're dating to see. You don't even put them up for your children to see. God sees your Christmas lights. Put your Christmas lights up for God to see. I thought, God, what a, what a great way to think of everything we do in our lives. Like, here's, here's what it is most. If I, if I labor in, in an, anonymity, if nobody knows it, um, but I've done it so that God sees it, then that's better than if I did something I don't believe in that everybody applauded me for. Um, and um, so that, that's just been a, it's, it's a choice I continually have to make and struggle with to affirm, but um, it's, it's the one I really believe in. I don't think that people would create anything that was truly original if they didn't think like that. You know, because if it's original and surprising, there's no track record for it. There's no proof that it's valid, right? Exactly. You have to, you, there's just no option but to take the risk. And so if that line of thinking didn't exist, then there'd be no way that you would take the risk. Exactly. I mean, I was always the kid that... Maybe that's why creativity and, and religion, religious thinking are aligned so tightly. It's that you, you have to make that leap of faith to produce something that's original, yes. virtually by definition. Yes. And despite, yes. you, you see that again, that theme sort of playing out in Secretariat, because all the advice that is given to the Ch Chenery, Ch Chenery is her name, right? M Ms. Ch Chenery. She owns this horse, remarkable horse, and anyone sensible would have sold him because she was going to lose everything, including yes. her credibility. Yes. But she didn't. And she was right, but there was no proof of that to begin with. It, that was a leap of faith. And I, don't, I really don't see how you can do something original without that leap of faith. Because it, just as I said, there's no track record. Well, Jordan, I, I hadn't thought of this at all before this conversation, but, um, but it strikes me that there's something, um, as you mentioned that, in common with you and her. And when I say how isolating it is to take that leap, um, I got to know Penny. I, I've, I've, I've had the, the opportunity to make several movies about people who are still living when the movie's being made. And every time I do it, I swear I won't do it again because I'd rather be free. To, yes, yes. Uh, but uh, uh, I got to know Penny and boy, there was fire in that woman. And, uh, and I, she was well into her 90s when we started making Secretariat. And she was incredibly uh, attractive. The, her, her eyes were so full of life and were so direct. And um, um, when we went to the Kentucky Derby together right after the movie was made, which was certainly a magical moment, you know, we just made the movie and now we're going to, it's the next running of the Kentucky Derby. And, and I got to go with Penny. And of course, Penny's in, at, at Churchill Downs, you know, she was, she was a rock star and, uh, you know, uh, everybody knew we were making the movie. Is uh, Disney movie is going to be seen by a lot of people, and and um, we we saw the race together, and everything builds up at the Kentucky Derby to the Derby itself. It's the Derby is like the eighth race of eighth or ninth race of a whole day of racing. So, uh, and then there are races after the Derby. So when the Derby was over, it builds this crescendo everybody walked back into the, the party rooms and forgot us. And I was left out on a balcony, just Penny and me. And, uh, and we're standing there together and I thought, okay, this is a sacred moment. And um, this is probably gonna be the last time I see her. And um, she looked down at the horse that had just won. They, were, they had, um, taken the saddle off the horse and we're kind of cooling him down. And, and she looked down and said, that's, that's a well, well-bred horse. Um, just casual comment. And I looked at her and said, Penny, 
we've come to the end of this movie process and, and now it won't, it, it won't be in the movie. Uh, but tell me, what did you not tell me? What have you, what, what did you want to say that has never been told? What, what have you kept from me? And she paused and she looked down at the, the box seats where she would sit as an owner. And she said, I sat down there alone every day, alone. The other owners would tolerate me, but they never accepted me. And, um, and I, I just thought about that. There, there's, there's that cost of stepping out there, of leaping out there alone. And, and the, the thing to me about it is like, a, there's a rabbi. And you have to believe it's worth doing for itself. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and in a way, you, you hope it's worth doing, but you don't know. I have, I have a friend here who's a rabbi named Mordecai Finley. And, um, you know, for anybody as Gentile as me, it's always fun when I say he's my rabbi. Uh, and Rabbi Finley was a Marine. He's a brilliant thinker. Um, and I, a, a friend named Steve Pressfield, who's an incredible writer, wrote a book called The War of Art, which you'd be very interested in, I think. Um, but Steve Pressfield was um, investigating his own faith. He had decided to, to, to look into spiritual matters. And he asked me to go along with him to Rabbi Finley's lectures at the University of Judaism. And uh, Rabbi Finley is a very practical guy. He's got a son in the Marine Corps. He's got a daughter in Israeli intelligence. And, and uh, he's a tough guy. And, and he said, you know, people say, follow your heart instead of your head. Well, your heart's the only thing less reliable than your head. So that statement sort of sat for a minute and somebody raised their hand and said, well, then how do we know what to do? And Rabbi Finley paused for a long time, as you do, by the way, when like, like you're considering the, the question afresh. It's not like, oh, here's my pat answer. It's like, well, let me find what, what's the true answer right now. And he paused like that. And he said, a couple of times in my life, I've been hanging by my fingernails over the abyss. And I let go because I couldn't hang on anymore. And I fell into the arms of God. And he said, I didn't know it would be the arms of God when I let go. If I had known it, it wouldn't truly have been letting go. And I was sitting there in this crowd of people going, and he looked at me and pointed at me and he goes, Christians know this. Christians know grace. Um, in our tradition, we, we have to sort of look for that concept. It's there, but we have to look for it. But he said, it's grace. And, and I think about that. It's, it's, I don't know every time when I sit down that, that I'm not wasting my time, that I'm not just going to ruin, you know, a ream of paper or, or, or that I'm not going to beggar my children um, or I'm not going to write something that somebody's going to hate. Uh, but, <clears throat> but my mother had a, a saying she gave me when we had just made, we were soldiers and my father died as it's written in my book about, at the end of We Were Soldiers, my father passed away. <clears throat> he died on 9-11. And, uh, and we, uh, after, after his funeral and I was back to work, um, I was calling my mother every day and, and I called her and said, how are you doing? And she said, well, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing okay. How are you doing? And I said, well, I'm nervous today. And she said, why? And I said, well, um, you know, I've, we're, we're testing the movie tonight. We're going to have its first public test. And she said, well, why does that make you nervous? And I said, well, there are a lot of people that come to these things intentionally just to be snarky, just to, just to you know, to sling mud at you. And, and when you've put your, your blood and your sweat and your tears and your money into a work and you know people are going to do that, it kind of makes you nervous. Yeah, and, I would and, say so. And my mother said, well, honey, if they crucified Jesus Christ, 
there are going to be some people that don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jordan, if they crucify Jesus Christ, there are going to be some people that don't like you. <laughs>